Did I tell you this one about the politician visiting a village and asking what their needs were? And uh, they said, we have two basic needs, sir, replied the villager. Firstly, we have a hospital, but there's no doctor. On hearing this, the politician whipped out his cell phone. And after speaking for a while, he reassured the village leader that the doctor would be there the next day. He then asked about the second problem they had. And uh, he said, secondly, sir, there is no cell phone coverage anywhere in the village. <laughs> You'll get that in a minute. Politicians, right? Romans chapter 9, well, a few, some are good. Some are good politicians. We don't want to condemn all politicians, but there's a few that are really honest and good and working for the people. Romans chapter 9, we begin a chapter having to do more with election than perhaps any other chapter in the Bible. I don't know that uh, there are chapters that deal with election some, but election is a good thing. Now, there are those Armenians who've made election a bad word. They've made predestination a bad word. They've made, I, I, I sometimes wonder about the level of intellectual pursuit, pursuit, especially spiritually, because these are words in the Bible and they're never in a negative connotation. You read every word in the Bible with election. You read every word in the Bible with predestination, every chapter and with the great doctrines of calling and so forth that God mentions in the eighth chapter and so forth, you will never find a negative connotation. You see, the Bible says that election is a choice, a decision. And I want to remind you that Israel was called of God for his purposes. Uh, have we forgotten, is God serving us or is God, or are we serving God? Have you forgotten which it is? Sort of like some people in Washington think we're serving them, right? They're supposed to be serving the people. Well, we're serving God. God is not serving us, right? And isn't it a wonderful thing that God is so magnificent in the teachings of doctrine and so forth that he is so awesome, sovereign, powerful, omniscient, knowing everything, omnipotent, having all power, omnipresent, being everywhere, that he could write to us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, do you know what whosoever it means? Uh, what is a whosoever? That is a verse you can put your name in. Amen. Instead of whosoever, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, the decrees of God keep everything in order. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible says the worlds which are framed by the word of God are kept in power by his word. That means the earth is always with no, absolutely no one having anything to do with it except the father himself, the sovereign God, keeps the earth spinning so it will stay in rotation. He keeps the earth moving around the sun. It doesn't get too close, burn us up. Doesn't get too far away, freeze us to death. It tilts for the seasons and so forth. Now, the Lord decreed that. All God did was when he created the earth, let's just take the earth, not the constellations, not the vast universe, not the galaxies, billions of them, not that. But the earth itself, he, he spoke by his power, he made a decree. This may be something you can remember uh, to, to understand how God's decrees work. He decreed that the earth would spin, and I believe it's 33,000 miles an hour. At the same time, he created gravity so that as the earth is spinning, it wouldn't shoot you into space and everything else. Because we are in America standing like this. We're not standing like this. We're standing like this. You may think you're seated like this. You're seated like this. This, earth, this building is that way. Gravity is consistent by the decree of God. What if he were to remove gravity for one minute? What would happen? Everything's gone. So you see, that's a decree. But everything is decreed. Because he's omniscient. You remember our studying about prophecy? Prophecy is predestination, which means God has decreed that 
things would go as they are in the nations and uh, as they prophesy Russia, Gog and Magog, Germany, all those are going to come down against Israel. Israel's going to be here, but Israel's right now in the timeout. All that I've given you in the charts, which shows you the decrees of God. Now, well, let's, let's put a meaning to that. God decreed everything that has happened and will happen, and it's predestined. Amazing, isn't it? Awesome, isn't it? You say, well, boy, that takes a burden off of my mess ups. No, no, no. No, no, God didn't decree your mess ups. God doesn't decree sin. God doesn't decree bad decisions. God doesn't decree anything that you can do with your will. And from the time you get up in the morning, off your bed, if you sleep at night, work during, during day, whatever, you have to decide all day long what you're going to eat, where you're going to go, are you going to go to work or not? Are you going to be mean? Are you going to be good? Are you going to make excuses? Are you going to be joyful? Are you going to have a bad attitude? Or You see, you decide all that. Nobody makes you decide all that. You decide all that. One thing we fight for in America is our liberty so we can make decisions for ourselves within the framework of the law. We don't want the government making decisions for us because by and large is bad news, right? Well, God is sovereign. And in his sovereignty, what he did is he set a decree in the future for what's going to happen to you by the, on the, and you made the decisions. Now this bothers a lot of theologians. It doesn't bother me because we have the keys to this in the scripture. If you'll look at the book of Acts, you'll see a good determination of the will of man. Now you should memorize this verse because every time you doubt and you try to say, well, I'm stuck in life or I'm, I'm the way I am because of God and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, that's not true. Listen to this. Uh, if you will look at Acts chapter, I believe it's in chapter two that I'm referring to. And if you look here, you will see as the Lord spoke, as, as uh, Peter spoke. And uh, let's see, here we go. Repent. Chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So God gives you a decision to repent. If he, couldn't, if he didn't give you a decision, then he wouldn't say do it. Is that right or not? You know, when, some, when, when God tells us to do something in his word, he isn't telling us something we can't do. Let me give you a cardinal rule. God will never, ever ask you to do something you cannot do. Ever. He won't do that. If God's will and God lets me know I'm to do something, it is an affront to him to tell him in reverse, I can't do that. You're arguing with God. Dangerous stuff. You say, no, I was just trying to be humbled. Well, God knows what you are. And he knows what you can do. And he knows what your future holds. He knows everything about it. And if he leads you to do something, I suggest you do it. I've tried to operate my life that way. Anytime I've argued with the Lord, guess who's been wrong? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Guess who's been wrong? Me. Because God proved me thereafter that he was right and I was wrong. Because he is always right. He's too wise too wise to ever be wrong. He can't be wrong. He's wisdom itself. So therefore, the Bible is telling us that anything we're asked to do in the scriptures, God has decreed we can do his will. Now, if he decreed the universe and he decreed this world and he decreed all the things that you and I are familiar with, if he decreed when you were born and gave you certain talents, by the way, the Lord gave you whatever talents you got. You'll never meet anybody who acquired talents. They can improve on performing their talents and the gifts of the Lord, but God has to give them to you or you don't have them. Singing is a perfect example. God has given some people a beautiful voice, yet they might not be using it for the Lord. Well, they're accountable. And some of us have not been so blessed. So don't make us miserable by trying to do something God didn't give you. 
Amen? Is that right or not? I stick to what I believe God has given me to do and try to be better at it all the time, honing those skills and talent. But God decreed before the foundation of the world, He already knew everything in time and eternity. He knew when I was going to be born, where I was going to be born. He decreed that He was calling me to the ministry, he, and, and He made it possible for my, me to have a will, and I used that will my whole life, and I used it when I trusted Him as Savior, and I used it when He called me to preach, and I would, I'm always smart whenever I do what He says. I'm not so smart when I don't do what He says. Can you write that down? This is, a little, this is a phrase you can live by. I am not so smart when I don't do what He has decreed I ought to do. I am smart when I do His will. That's life. That's all it is. So election has a beautiful part of predestination. What do I mean by that? Well, the Lord has to call you before you hear from Him. I mean in a personal way. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 because I know some of you have trouble with this. Some of you are brought up with false teaching. You're brought up with Arminianism and carryovers from the Catholic Church and the rest. And uh, they really take away your free will. And they claim power they don't have. But in Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, look at verse 29, for whom he did foreknow. Now, this is a process for people in knowing what was going to happen. He also did predestinate. See, in his foreknowledge, he does what? I'm sorry I didn't hear you. In his foreknowledge, he does what? Predestinates. See, you can't do anything that he doesn't decree. The possibility of doing. And he does not, since he does not impose upon your will, it's not God's fault when you hear the word of God, if you're lost, it's because you would not respond. The Holy Spirit drawing you. Jesus said, you can't come to me unless the Father calls you. So this is what he does. He calls us at the preaching of the gospel. We have, we have missionaries all over the world that are preaching the gospel, and they're called. Many of them receive the Lord by their choice. Not because they can or can't by God. God does not turn anyone away who wishes to be saved. Do you understand that? Now, fatalists may teach you differently, but that's not the true teaching of the Word of God. I read theologians who say that, and they are wrong. Why? Because I compare Scripture with Scripture. And if something doesn't jive, if it's a you know, square hole and you're trying to put a peg in it, that isn't going to work. So if any Scripture confronts or contradicts another way of believing or another Scripture, you've got to go back and do your homework because you're wrong. And many people have so much pride, they can't admit they're wrong. After a guy writes, he writes his book, how's he going to permit, if he finds out later on I was a little wrong, well, I made a lot of money on it. These people might sue me, so I'll just keep my mouth shut. It's called the Washington, D.C. syndrome. All right, now, <clears throat> well, I named it. They're not going to admit it. He that, uh, now listen to this. He that spared not his own son, and, uh, but delivered him up for us all, and how do we know that? Well, we go back to the book of Acts. And the Word of God tells us, uh, if you would please listen to this. And the Bible says, Him, He who you took and crucified the Lord of glory by the determinate foreknowledge of God. Wow. Wow, that's the two things in one verse that explains all of this. Don't make it complicated. It's not complicated. It's very simple. And what's the simplicity of it? That God is omniscient. See, if you were omniscient, you'd understand this. Or you can just believe it by trusting the Word of God. And the more you trust the Word of God, the more you will understand it. And the more spiritual discernment will come to you. God has His purposes. He has allowed a man and woman to get married by his knowledge, by his omni and, and then they have a son. But if God didn't give that life, they wouldn't have a son. And he's placed talent in that son because he knows the future of what that son's going to do. Just because God knows what I'm going to do does not compel me to do it. Right? Amen or not? 
See, somehow we think, well, if, if God knows I'm going to do it, I'm compelled to do it. No, you're not. You're acting like a carnal, thinking, flawed, small pea brain human being. Because that's what we really all are. Small brain, aren't we? No, you're not. What's your IQ? What if you get to the what we call the very learned status? Some of them, some of us really believe we're smarter than we are, don't we? And then later on we find out, well, maybe I wasn't all that smart. You'd be wise in life if you listen to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Let him teach you and just always believe I'm not as smart as God. Because if you don't listen to God, what you're saying is, I am smarter than the Bible, the Word of God, or God leading me. And there are many Christians too proud for their own good. Pride is a stinking, what's the worst stink I've ever, it was a skunk. I was a boy, we ran over one with a car. So we burned the car. <laughs> no, not really. But you couldn't get rid of that skunk. I mean, they have a powerful odor. I mean, it'll make you sick. That's what pride smells like to God. Lucifer's big sin was pride. The rest came afterwards. So when you think you're something great or smart or whatever, maybe you ought to think about it a little longer. Let me confess to you, I am nothing. How do I know that? The Bible tells me that. That means that I shouldn't presume any answer to anything without the wisdom of Scripture. That's what that means. That means for your own good. If you're all that smart, why did you have to go to school to learn how to read and write? Or whatever. Or take classes, whatever. See, we're not really, we get filled with pride, but this... These scriptures will help us to understand. Does God know we need wisdom to make great decisions in life? So from the time we begin making decisions for ourselves, and even we, you know, we, we, we can't figure out what time that is. Does a baby make wise decisions? Well, of course a baby makes wise decisions. They cry when they're hungry. That's a pretty wise decision, isn't it? So they, you start making decisions when you're born. And then it grows from there. And your whole life, you're making decisions. Do I want to go through the turmoil of education? Do I want to achieve under the wisdom of God? Do I want to live this kind of life? Or do I want to live that kind of life? Do I want to try to outsmart God? Do I want to sow something that I know I'm going to reap and I believe I can get it by it? I believe I can avoid that crop. But remember, God has no crop failures. That's what wisdom decision making is. So God has cleared the way through predestination of your choices. No, that's God's. No, it is, but it's yours. Did the Lord know about my children, my precious wife? Sure. Did he know all that? Did he make me? I mean, there's no, there's no wife who can look at her husband and say, well, God made me marry you. Sort of like the woman that got mad one day and said to her husband, you know, I wouldn't have married you if I'd have known you were so stupid. And he was mad. He said... You should have known I was stupid when I asked you to marry me. You can't beat that game. However, however, you know, our life unfolds. And I look back at all the time. The Lord led here and the Lord opened this path and the Lord did this over here and the Lord blessed me here. I, I wish I was writing his will every minute because I could get everything in the world in this life to give me joy and the best life possible. It's only when you go out of his will at the fork in the road when you make decisions that you're in trouble. And that can lead to a lot of consequences, a lot of heartaches for the future. But just remember this, God lays no impulse or compulsion, I would say, compulsion to, for you to do anything other than you will do. And he knows what you're going to do, even though you may try to do otherwise, you can't. And so I've given you that definition in this chapter, so I hope you'll look at that. So the Word of God is saying to us, look at, uh, look at Acts 2, if you want to write this down, Acts 2.23. Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel 
See, this was all settled before man was created. This was settled before God did anything. This was settled in eternity. Him, Jesus, being determined, delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Oh, there's a key. Foreknowledge because God is what? What is He? Omniscient. Let's say it together. God is omniscient. And we ought to add to that, and I am not. <laughs> See, we do the best we can with what we've got today, and we make plans for tomorrow, but we don't have the foggiest idea what's going to happen tomorrow. You know that? We get in our car and we make plans and goals. We don't know, but God knows. Don't fight providential things that happen. All right, so the Bible says uh, that uh, this is what we should look at. You have taken the Jews, the Roman government, the hierarchy, the chief high priest, all those are included, all of them. You have taken, when you said crucify him, give us Barabbas, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, if you'll write that verse down and judge everything that happens in your life by that, you will understand the creeds that God has set, God's decrees, and you will understand predestination, and you will understand election, you will understand foreknowledge, because if, if, see, you can't choose God without God choosing you. You're going into His family. You're being born into His family. You're being adopted into His family. Now, there's no conflict there. If there's a conflict, your mind hasn't got it yet. So you've got to pray spiritually that you can understand that. You've got to pray spiritually that you can grab it. And I, I confess, I've wrestled with it from every possible, plausible, good writer almost that I can think of to read all this material. And I believe with all my heart that whosoever will may come. I believe everybody can be saved who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. End of statement. And God makes it happen. You cannot be unborn. It is an unconditional promise. You are safe and saved forever. There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches. And I don't care what Dr. Bottle Stopper says. I've been a Dr. Bottle Stopper all my life. All my adult life. Because everything I get comes from the Bible, not from my opinion, or not from what I was raised with. I wasn't raised with anything. See, I was blessed because I didn't know anything when I got saved. When I was 15, I couldn't quote any verses. Now, some of you were raised in religion, and you've been messed up, and you have to fight that all the time, right? Amen? Well, if you come to a Bible church, you won't be messed up too long. We'll help you. Because all we teach is the Bible. That's it. Amen. Now, having said all that, Here's uh, eight things we discussed last time. We discussed a few of them. I'll try to finish them tonight. If you'll look at Israel's election described in chapter 9, verses 113. Now, how did this happen? Well, Abraham was not a... Was, he was in Ur of the Chaldees, an idolatrous, pagan, heathen land. I mean, there was no Jerusalem then. There was no city of God. There was none of that. And the Bible says he chose Abraham. Well, Abraham must have been a great guy. No, it's not what the Bible says. He chose Abraham. There are 400 verses about, a little over 400 verses in the Bible about the faith of Abraham. He, when God showed him who he was, he believed, trusted God immediately and thoroughly. What do I mean by that? God says, Abraham, I don't want you living here among these idolaters and among your relatives, among all these, you can't accomplish what I want you to do by living here. Amen? You know, you've got to be sure about the will of God for where you're going and where you're living. I've told you stories about people writing me after they left here and moved somewhere to get a $50 a week raise and found out that it was more expensive to live there anyway, and they couldn't find a church teaching the Bible. It was, they were filled with all kinds of stuff, committees, all kinds of stuff that was intimidating to preachers and on and on. They couldn't, you know, it was a hard place out in the country and so forth. You better be sure about God's will before you move anywhere. I'm telling you with wisdom, it's better to be in a spiritual house of God 
and at, at where you live than it is to be living in the greatest states or cities in this world and not have the house of God and worship in the Bible taught you. And you can't get it on television. It's pre-programmed to make you fluffy in most cases. Never help you grow. Do you really think people that just watch television, televangelists ever grow? No. They have to get more money so they can send more money for the higher lifestyles. I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe it's scriptural. don't believe it's right. I believe it's one of the things that, that Satan uses against the people of God to keep robbing them of their money instead of putting it into the Lord's work and missions where it belongs. You're making those dudes wealthy in the name of ministry and God is robbing people who support them instead of giving it to scriptural causes. I can prove that. I don't want to get started on that. All right, so we discussed adoption, right? That God chooses us because of his love. Isaiah 43, 20, 21. I'm going to let you look up the verses, most of them. Uh, we, we'll go over some of them, but I'm going to let you look, up, look these up so that you can confirm what you're studying. The second thing we talked about was the glory, the presence of God in the tabernacle. Now, the glory of God has come down in the tabernacle. The Shekinah glory, it happened to Israel because he was leading them out of Egypt with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. He protected and blessed them. They were disobedient, so he had to deal with them. But remember what I said about unconditional? They were disobedient, and an 11-day journey turned into 40 years because they were disobedient. God had to grow them. God had to chastise them. God had to punish them. He had to do all those things to bring them into conformity, and he's still doing that. But he stopped blessing Israel as his number one witness in the world. They were supposed to propagate and they were supposed to proselyte these false religions and bring them into true faith with God. And in most cases, they got proselyted themselves, and God had to deal with them. So God gave Israel his unconditional election. When God gives eternal life, it is never short term. It's everlasting. Now, you really don't have to be brilliantly educated or sophisticated in this world to know what everlasting is, do you? Well, I think I've got an everlasting coal. No, honey, you just got a temporary coal. One way or the other, either you're going to die with it and you won't have it anymore, or you're going get, to get it healed, right? Amen, is that right or not? That's not everlasting. Well, you know, I have this everlasting headache. No, no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't have an everlasting car. There is nothing you can see, touch, or feel other than the Word of God, which is forever settled in heaven, everything else is temporary. But life from God, the new birth, all these things are predestinated. They can't be broken. Who's going to challenge God? You know anybody? I imagine some of you and I have tried to challenge God at times. You know, well, is this really true? Lord, is this really going to happen? <laughs> you can't challenge God. So the Bible says there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Why? Because you're predestined. How do I know that? The Bible says we're seated together in heavenly places with Christ. He's talking with God. We're to, he's talking about the future beyond our life where we will be. See, God doesn't speak in the present only. So you read this eighth chapter, you see all the procedure that God goes through when we are saved. Yet he has never said to anybody, <clears throat> well, you're too big a sinner. You've committed so many sins, I don't think I can save you. Have you ever thought since you've been saved and knowing a lot of people, you know, really bad, you call them bad people, but uh, we're all bad. Now, we're not as bad as we could be. I mean, we could be a lot worse than we are, but we're as bad off as we can be before we're saved because everybody's lost before they're saved. See, the Catholics have it backwards. Everybody's saved and then they get lost if you don't do what they say. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us we're all lost. Jesus said in John 3, 16, and then in verse 17, that the world is condemned and everybody in it is cursed. And to have everlasting life, God's grace in His mercy has to pick us up to that level of holiness, which only He has. He gives us that holiness, which is our gift. 
You can't be better by works. In fact, you'll be worse. Jesus said a demon left and told his buddies, you know, they came back and swept the house and seven more, six more moved in. That, that's a story illustrating the fact that we get worse by our own moral goodness. You say, well, wait a minute now. I've given up two or three bad habits. Well, you're just a cleaned up sinner condemned for hell. That's all. You're going to be saved. What you do in practice has nothing to do with where you're going. But we as believers, now sinners who don't know the Lord practice sin because they're looking for pleasure, fulfillment, and some meaning to life. Saved people can do things wrong too. Remember now, let him that standeth take heed lest he fall. What does that mean? That means you're capable of any sin you committed before you were saved, committing it again or committing them. The flesh is dying and dead. The mind of the flesh is condemned. It's not going to heaven. We're going to heaven because we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. The body's condemned. The mind of the flesh is condemned. So we know that's true. Now, look at the covenants. When God makes a covenant, let me explain this real quickly. I can give you the, the structure of Abrahamic covenant where God made a covenant with himself and Abraham was an observer. What do I mean by that? Well, you see, when God makes a covenant, he makes it with himself. The reason is he's the only one who's holy, perfect, and pure, and he's the only one who can keep the covenant because I can't. God could come and make a covenant with me, and I'd break that covenant before very long. Wouldn't you? God, keep, God doesn't do that. God makes a covenant with himself with Abraham. He made it with Moses and gave him the, as the lawgiver. But Moses was condemned by his own law. In chapter 20 of Exodus, he's given the Ten Commandments. And you've never met a man, you've never met a woman, you've never met a human being that has ever kept the Ten Commandments. There's only one who's kept the Ten Commandments. Guess who he is? The Lord Jesus. He said in Matthew 5, 17, I've come to fulfill the law, which means, folks, really, it's all about the Lord, isn't it? You know, whatever we have or whatever we've done, give glory to God because it's all about Him. He had to do it through us or it wouldn't have been done. A lady said to me one day, she said, I bet you're proud of your church building and everything, aren't you? I said, I am not. I'm pleased but not proud. I'm not proud of it because I can't take the credit. God saved you and brought you here, those of you that are saved. God made things happen to raise the money, to send out missionaries all over the world. I can't take credit for that because I didn't do it. Together we give, and I give certainly a lot, but, only, but who gave me the money to give? Oh, I know, it must have been Lucifer, one of his lieutenants, principalities and so forth, said, you know, he's, that pastor is getting a little low on money. Let's give him a bunch of money so he can give it to missions. Do you think that happened? Maybe you think that happened. No. So the Bible says, I am nothing. I can do nothing. Listen, listen carefully. This could save your future. I can do nothing. But... I can do all things through Christ. Now, that only refers to the will of God. You're not going to do anything through Christ that is not the will of God. Thirdly, I don't know anything worth knowing except the Bible. You know, everything I've studied and read and the books and schooling, everything I've done, it really is a poof of vapor. <laughs> what good is it? Oh, yeah, well, I, I, at one time in chemistry, I solved a problem and won a box of chocolate. You know, I studied, you know, I studied uh, algebra, I studied uh, history, I've studied all that stuff in, 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 uh, in secular studies and school and university. What good is that? You say, well, you know where Spain is. No, all I got to do is look at a map and say, there's Spain. When you boil it all down to it, life is vanity, just like Solomon said, except the Word of God. Everything else you got going except the Word of God or does not fit in the framework of the Word of God is vanity. It's going to perish with you. 
But you know what? I'm never going to perish because of the grace of God. I'm going to heaven. And all my things that, that I've done in his name through him, that he's done through me, really, I should say it that way, even though the Bible says I can do all things through Christ. But it's the Lord who, do, who allows me to do it and so forth. Every bit of that is preserved and growing in heaven today. I can never, ever be obscure again. I want to be obscure. I, I don't want any publicity. I don't want that stuff. I don't want that stuff. I want to do everything I do for the Lord and for your benefit and for the church's benefit and our missionaries' benefit. If I don't give full credit to the Lord, shame on me. I need to repent, right? Amen or not? But we work together as the body of Christ. Now let's look at something else. These covenants God made with himself for the benefit of Abraham and those who would follow him. Then he made the ones for Moses, even though the law condemns him. Then he made the one for uh, David. He, he, he also had other covenants like covenant with uh, Isaac and covenant with Jacob and so forth. And we'll see that in, in just a few minutes. Now, the giving of the law, we talked about that already. And then uh, God dealt with Israel to show what God's holiness reveals as to show what sin is and is not. Now, some of you come from backgrounds and you're a little confused, maybe, if you grew up in certain style to churches or so forth. I have friends that came from some areas, mostly in the upper areas of certain parts of the country, that teach that it's a sin for women to wear open-toed shoes men to wear gold-framed glasses, men to wear colored shirts, women to wear trousers, pants. They say, yeah, we got that right out of the Bible. I said, no, you didn't. You got it right away from Israel. The Bible says that it, women, although women did wear trousers under their dresses, you know, these dresses come here, the pants go all the way to the shoe. So they got that wrong. You couldn't mix, uh, you couldn't mix cotton with uh, linen or the other things they mix it with. You couldn't do that in Israel. But uh, they took it further than Israel took it. I mean, they had all kind of ideas about what sin is. Sin is men letting their hair grow long. Some men think they're going to be stronger if they let their hair grow longer. But that only applies to Samson. It ain't going to help you. Son, if you let your hair grow three feet, you ain't going to be able to pick up two more ounces. It ain't going to help. But if that's what you want to do, go for it. And, and, and I could get off on this tangent about 1 Corinthians where it was a sin. There's four times more scripture verses talking about men having their hair co head covered than there is about women wearing short hair. We're Gentiles. We're not in the city of Corinth. In the city of Corinth, they had houses of, of uh, they were really brothels, but they called them priestesses. And they would wear their hair short to, on the streets and so forth to attract men. And that's how they did it. So Paul said, let your hair grow long. That's the glory of God. You're saved now. What does that have to do with today? Women of the streets wear their hair long and short, I guess. And wearing your hair long ain't going to make you holier. But they pick up on that and think, oh, this is for me. No, it isn't. You can wear your hair however you want it, or no hair, or shave your head, whatever you want to do. I, you know, I mean, some of us are glad to have gray hair because at least it's not turning. It, it's okay if it turns gray. It isn't turning loose. You know, we're glad of that. But see how people make sins out of all kinds of things. This is called legalism. And what it's really doing is saying, you, we've got a list for you. The preacher's got a list for you, and the deacons have got a list for you. You follow this list, and you'll be holy. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, they say, well, it's a sin to wear makeup because Jezebel wore makeup. Well, Jezebel wore makeup to attract a man, prophet, and some men to help her rule with, she was the priestess of Baal. She was a lot of other things. Well, I mean, whether you wear makeup or not, ladies, it's up to you. Now, men, it's another story. But 
ladies, if you don't want to marry makeup, that's your business. If you do, it ain't going to make you holier not to wear them. There, there's some ch churches or cults or whatever you want to call them. It looks like they hit themselves in the face with a white powder or flour or something to try to look pale and white. You've got enough working against you. You don't have to do that. If you want to wear makeup, fine. If you don't want to wear makeup, that's your business. But I have comments about that that I'm not going to make. Anyway, attraction. Now, the promises, many Old Testament promises have been fulfilled and many are yet to be fulfilled for the Jews. Do you remember the chart I gave you? God's not through with Israel. It's just time out. Two teams are on the floor. Time out. Two teams are on the field. Time out. That means nothing counts while it's time out. You can run the ball up and down. You do whatever you want to. Nothing is scoring. Nothing is counting. Israel is at time out. Has been for 2,000 years. But many of them have been saved through the church and through the gospel. Not through the church, but through the gospel by coming to the house of the Lord. But if you're a Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, we're all saved the same way. You're not special because you're saved from out of any circumstance. Is that right or not? Amen. All right. Now, we have then the fathers. Look at verse, uh, the seventh point. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve sons of Jacob formed the foundation for the nation of Israel. Jesus said something about that. He talked about the elders in heaven. He talks about these things because, you see, the new Jerusalem is like a double pyramid coming down out of heaven. It's not heaven where the Father is. It comes down. It's called the new Jerusalem. You can read about how big it is and all that. I've got material and charts and so forth on all that. So, therefore, that's the foundation of the, of the nation. Then the Messiah, Jesus, was a Jew. Why did somebody came in one day, some guy came in and stood up. I mean, right in the service years ago. I had all these flags up here. We got a flag for Israel over there. He said, what are you doing with a, with a flag for the Zionist Jews who hated Jesus? I said, sir, you're disturbing a service, and if you don't sit down, I'm going to have you put out. I said, the Jews need the gospel like everybody else, and we've got Palestinian missionaries, and we're going to see everyone have the gospel if they want it. We are not protecting any part of Zionism or anything else. But we love the nation of Israel because God says our attitude toward Israel is God's chosen people. Even though they're not pleasing Him right now, even though it's time out for them, we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and I'm a Bible believer, and I'm going to do that. We don't pray for Israel because they're perfect. I don't even pray for the church members because they're perfect. They're not. That's why I pray for them mostly, many of them. Not you. I was talking about other people. Okay, so all these things are true. Now look at the page two. I'm, I'm do, not doing well tonight in some ways. In some ways I am. Now in Romans 9, 1 through 33, here's your homework for next week. Romans 9, 1 through 33. I've given you a good many notes here. And I want you to read all these verses over at least a couple of times, three times, four times, five times. It won't hurt you. If you miss your program, it'll be the same next week. Same old stuff. You, I tell you what you knew. You watch 10 minutes of news, well, at different times, and get everything you're going to get if you watch it all day. Come on. It's corruption coming out everywhere. And the Lord said, when I come back, you, <laughs> it, this is the way it's going to be, and I can go down the list and give you prophetic fulfillments of what happens in my lifetime from the restoration of Israel to what's happening now in this world. The culture of this world is totally one together turning against God. Now, you can believe that or not. I can prove it. There are, there are less, you know, church attendance has fallen 40% since the 40s and 50s. Do you know that? One out of five churches is closing. Did you know that? Our church is always fragile. You get enough people leaving and enough people stop giving, it's fragile. Churches go out because it takes faith and grace to keep the, great, the, the church going. See, we're, we're, not in a, we're not in a guaranteed situation. What's great and happening now at this church is awesome. 
Missionaries were supporting. Souls were seeing saved. But Satan is warning us stopped. Did you hear me? And he does it one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And praise God for new people that are coming and praise God for you who've been so faithful so many years. We've got folks been here more than 40 years. You believe that? That, 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 isn't, that doesn't happen. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? But you don't, you don't take God for granted. Oh, God would never let liberty close up. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. We're accountable. I'm accountable. If I bring in heresy or immorality or don't pay attention and, run, and, and, and pastor this church by the word of God and work with the deacons and trustees and the staff and everybody else, this church can close up just like any church in town can close up. The cults won't close up. Romanism won't close up. Listen to me. Listen to me. It takes the doctrines of grace to keep us strong. Amen? And we want to keep up. Now look at Romans 9, 1 to 3, the bearing of the foregoing truce upon the con condition and destiny of the chosen people, Israel, election, the call, and the calling of the Gentiles. All this works together. Notice at the top, the doctrine of grace. What is the doctrine of grace? Well, first of all, what it is not. It must be pure from works. Any time you come to God and want to give Him something to save you, you have violated grace. If it's grace, it's no more works. You offend God when you bring Him your filthy rags of righteousness. And when, like Cain, you bring Him the fruit of the ground, which is already His, cost you nothing. God has His ways and His purposes. The human merit. Oh, well, I'm so good, God ain't going to send me to hell. No, you're doing it to yourself because you don't have holiness. So you can't get holiness without the Lord. Justice and self-worth. You bring self-worth to God, it's an odious stench in His nostrils. Or there will always be misunderstanding similar to the dispensations. What about that? And I'm going to teach the dispensations again one day. If I live long enough, the Lord doesn't come. So it's going to take me a little while to get through Romans. But I'm going to teach the dispensations because many of you don't know about that. You don't know about the dispensation of grace. You don't know about the dispensation of innocence in the Garden of Eden. You don't know about the dispensation of law. I think there's nine, there's seven established dispensations where God makes a covenant, works with that covenant, then He brings judgment and He has another covenant like the grace period we're in, the church of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the next statement I have, I have talked about many times because it's the antidote of fatalism. I'm not a fatalist. I don't believe in fatalism. I believe what the Bible says. God lays, now put this in writing for you, God lays no compulsion upon the human will. You can't blame God for one lousy sin, one mess up, one bad decision, nothing. You're accountable. You can't blame anybody else either. I can't look at, I can't blame anybody. I can't come to God and say, well, Lord, I would have done better, but you know. No, no. If you follow God's will, you're going to be, he's not going to charge you for something that isn't his will. Right? Is that correct or not? All right, so the Bible says in everywhere, God lays no compulsion upon the human will. He didn't make Moses do anything. He didn't make Moses sin. He didn't make Abraham do anything. He, he makes nobody do anything. He don't even make them do what's right. They have to will to do it to follow God's will. There's the ability to decide and do other than God knows you will decide or do. But you never will because God knows the future. It's so minute. It could be, you know how, how things happen in our life. We decide, well, things would be better if I did this, or things would be better if I did that. And so you do something that in the end you say, I wish I hadn't have done that. Well, God didn't make you do that. Nobody else made you that. Even if, ladies, even if your husband asks and says, why don't you become a blonde? 
You've been a brunette long enough. You have the will to say no. Now, ladies, come on. You know that you know how to say no. It's men who have trouble with it. Now, I, I learned professionally how to say no. I'm talking about professional learning. I'm not talking about pick it up somewhere. I, brother, brother uh, Dan, brother, I just know how to say no. I'm a professional at saying no. I'll teach you that sometime if you want to know. You want to know? I see hands raising all the way across the back there. But <clears throat> you never will. You'll never do other than God knows you're going to do. That is the supreme law of God's creation and the sovereign law of God. In His creation, He created us uniquely with a will that He will not violate or force. He will persuade, the Holy Spirit will convict, but you make the decision. Look, honey, you can't blame anybody for who you married. You can say, well, the pastor encouraged us years ago, and I said, okay, you know, too bad. You made the decision. Right? You're as bad as the woman who's in the grocery store. She had three little ones. They were nagging and pulling on her and pulling things from the shelf and everything else, and she's, her hair's falling down. It's a mess. This older lady walked over to her and said, honey, I, I feel so far, sorry for you with these three kids. They, they're just into everything. Uh, you know, now that you think about it, with these three little ones pretty close together, would, would, you, would you have three like this again? She said, yes, but not these three. <laughs> now, I've told you that before. I haven't forgotten that I told you. I can remember everything that I've told you in the way of things like that. But seriously, we make the decisions. How you raise your children, how you discipline them, how you treat them, how you feed them, how you keep them healthy. It's all your decision, and God will give you wisdom. Listen, if you pursue wisdom and pursue the Word of God, you'll get every answer you need. We're just too lazy. We want to watch Oprah for five minutes and figure out how to do it, or some Dr. Phil or somebody. What's that got to do with being a Christian? Nothing. Because they, they're not going to quote Scripture to you. And, and I know some of you may think, well, you're picking on Oprah. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm quoting her video. I've got her video clip that said to a woman who stood up and objected when she said a told man named Toll from England has these ways to God. And, she, and Oprah, that's not right. Jesus, And she said, oh, yes, it is. You find your way to God. So she's a pantheist. So don't confront me at the end of the service. I know what I'm talking about. You're not going to get anywhere getting the wisdom of this world. It's going to lead you down. This world is, is condemned. The culture of this world is condemned. Follow the wisdom of the Lord because he has, his will is built into every, to every word of his scripture and he'll, he'll help us. But you never will. When you leave here tonight, you may decide a lot of things, but God already knows what you're going to decide. From some of them, he may have to protect you. From some of them, he's just going to let you hit your head. From some of them, he's going to bless you. What do you want? See, if you want the blessings of God, you've got to follow the will of God. The God, God is not going to bless your will. You say, well, Lord, I'm going to do this. I hope you bless it. He is not, unless it's his will. I got another flash. I teach on prayer from the scriptures. Now, I don't, I'm going to give you my opinion because my opinion isn't worth anything. But I will tell you this, the scriptures tell us when you pray, you must pray in the will of God. Now, you've been taught by televangelists and others, you can command God and he'll do it. Oh, you know, grab it, blab it and grab it or, you know, that's lies. It's lies. You think God's going to bless your will? Not unless it's his will. When your will is given to the Lord and it's the Lord's will, he'll bless you every time in it as you pray. Otherwise, you might as well not pray. That's Scripture. Well, let me give you the greatest. Who do you think the greatest was in the Scripture at praying? Who do who you think the greatest was, greatest example we have in the Scriptures about praying? 
Who do you think it was? Yeah, why would you hesitate? It's Jesus, wasn't it? How did he, how did he end his prayers? Even in the garden of Gethsemane, when he was about to face sin for all of us and a horrible death, he said, Lord, if it could work out, and he was just in agony speaking as a human being. Nevertheless, thy will be done. Are you brave enough to pray for God's will to be done when you start praying to God? Because he's not going to pay attention to your tears. The only thing he pays attention to is faith or trust. And faith and trust means you're walking in the will of God, right? So be sure you're in the will of God and ask God for whatever you want. But I suggest you thank him about ten times before you ask him for anything else. <laughs> 